The mid-2010s, just a few years into the lifespan of the Wii U, but Nintendo knew something was wrong. Despite reasonably strong sales for some hard hitters like Mario Kart and Smash Brothers, hardware sales were low. Competitors Microsoft and especially Sony were streaks ahead in terms of sales, and finances were starting to get tight, with Nintendo running a loss in 2012 and 2013. Management knew something drastic had to be done. The upcoming and highly anticipated Zelda was approaching release, but something other than a normal release was planned. An entirely new approach was decided. One that would change Nintendo's entire mindset regarding console development. Rewind a few decades and we see a very similar story elsewhere. Another icon of the gaming industry. A few years after a console release with things not going well. This time it's Atari and the Jaguar. Unlike Atari, Nintendo managed to pull things around by releasing the Switch with Zelda Breath of the Wild as the pack-in. Atari also had plans to release a revitalized console, the Jaguar Duo. A combined Jaguar and Jaguar CD, similar at least superficially to the more successful PlayStation. Could Atari have pulled things around like the Switch, a new console, a killer app pack-in, and the increased storage of CD, along maybe with a strong marketing push to really send it home? Would it have been enough? First, let's look at how Nintendo managed to pull things around with the Switch. The hardware is not actually very different, with the tablet device and the ability to switch between portable and docked play. However, Nintendo's philosophy towards third parties changed drastically. Although, even today, Nintendo is not as attractive to third parties as Sony and Microsoft, they made a big effort to improve things with the Switch. They used an easier to program and more compatible NVIDIA chipset. They talked to developers like Bethesda and EA during development. They talked to, to indies and provided them with implementation support and tools for the Switch. These efforts appear to have yielded some fruit with over 300 games released for the Switch by the end of 2017, when Nintendo only expected 100. We can't forget the previously mentioned launch strategy either, a marketing strategy that positioned the Switch as an entirely new way of gaming. Nintendo weren't trying to defeat Sony by releasing the same thing as them with more power. They were looking to the future trying to create the next step in gaming with a concept none had ever seen before. The second pillar of this launch strategy was their killer app, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, with other Nintendo hard haters like Mario, Mario Kart and Splatoon following shortly. These blockbuster games encouraged people to make the dive and pick up a Switch, in turn encouraging developers to spend resources on the console, which in turn encouraged other developers, both of which encouraged new consumers, creating a positive feedback loop. Meanwhile, what happened with Atari? With some better decisions, could they have pulled a similar feat and attracted the necessary third-party support to boost the system? One possible way to encourage third-party support would have been with a new, much simplified design, one which ideally would have also boosted the power of the system, in order to be more capable of playing the impressive 3D games the PlayStation and N64 were playing. However, this would have taken more time and money, two things Atari did not have in 1995. By that time, Atari hadn't had a hit since the 2600 in the 70s, and had poured huge money into both software and hardware development and support for the Jaguar. Indeed, the planned Jaguar Duo which inspired this video never even saw the light of day. Atari collapsed too quickly. The Jaguar wasn't as weak as is commonly believed anyway, with John Romero once saying that with a few tweaks the Jaguar could have been as powerful as the PlayStation. After all, Alien vs Predator and what is often considered the best port of Doom were released on the system, as well as impressive looking 3D games like Cyber Morph, World Tour Racing and Fight for Life. So maybe a design that only slightly modified the Jaguar, but included some heavy hitter games on launch could have worked. Maybe driving sales and attach rates and thus attracting third parties? In theory it sounds good, this is basically what every console strategy is. But where was the Atari to find these hard hitting games? The Jaguar had been out for two years and had not seen a steady release of high quality games. Atari themselves had produced most of the games for the system, and had never produced a system seller. And without a system seller, why would a third party developer invest the time and resources to produce an exclusive or even a high quality port for a new Atari system? Atari had just spent the last two years mismanaging the Jaguar. Why would devs have faith in a new Atari project? It's true that a fast selling system will attract developers even if it's difficult to program for like the Jaguar, but it's just another barrier to entry and the Jaguar already had plenty. By 1995, Atari had long since run out of killer IPs to get gamers excited. Despite Tempest 2000 and Missile Command 3D being well regarded and selling reasonably well, these were reboots of arcade games barely out of the 70s. They did not have the pulling power of Mario or Zelda or the soon to be released Tomb Raider. It's not like Atari hadn't been trying to produce good games up to this point, it's that they weren't able. Many of the games they produced were rushed or just plain not fun. It's rare if ever that we can say that about a Nintendo game. 
so it's unlikely Atari would have been able to come up with this hard hitting game at this point if it hadn't been able to before then. In comparison, Nintendo was able to release Zelda on the Switch as a launch title and had huge IPs like Mario, Smash Bros and Pokemon coming down the line. By 1995, Atari was cancelling planned releases, not making more. A key reason why Nintendo were able to bounce back in the mid-2010s while Atari went under in the mid-90s is that, despite making some losses, Nintendo were sitting on a huge cash reserve that could have kept them going for a long time, even if they had kept making losses for years. They had the time and money to put into developing good games and to think about their future console philosophy. Atari had poured a lot of money into the development of the Jaguar, had developed the cancelled Panther, and had developed some failed computer hardware. They had poured money into game after game for the Jaguar, few of which ran a profit, and they were still working on things like a VR deck and the Jaguar Duo, all this without a hit system on the shelves. Even the Lynx with its mediocre sales had been discontinued by this point, and they hadn't had a hit console since the 70s to provide some kind of cushion for all this spending. In 2016, Zelda was already in development and approaching completion. The moment for Atari to produce a reimagined Jaguar was in 1993, not 1995. But the thinking that led to the Jaguar was completely different from the thinking that led to the PlayStation or N64. A console needs more than power to do well. But the PlayStation was CD capable and they beat the N64. Couldn't the Jaguar have done the same? Well, the philosophy of the PlayStation was to be as easy and cheap as possible for third parties to develop on. The plan being to let them develop the software library that would sell consoles, while keeping the console at an affordable price point. They achieved this in style, with developers like Square and Capcom abandoning Nintendo to develop for the system. If this was Atari's plan, they certainly didn't achieve it with the Jaguar. The Jaguar design wasn't even settled until very close to launch, with constant changes being made preventing developers designing and testing for the system, leading to few games available at launch. And as we learnt with the Switch, the launch window is a key moment in a console's lifespan. Add to that the notoriously difficult architecture, and many devs were put off completely or released substandard ports. This then caused sales to slow down after release, forcing Atari to release rushed games just to have something on the system. And after they didn't sell either, even more devs would be put off, with many cancelling planned releases, and the fate of the Jaguar was sealed. Although this probably also affected Nintendo in the fifth generation and beyond, they had a blockbuster lineup of first party games and a few second party titles to rely on during the lean years, a luxury Atari couldn't afford, literally. On a more philosophical level, the N64 and PlayStation were the most successful consoles of the fifth generation in part because they sold the next paradigm shift. They weren't making old games with fancier graphics or gimmicky marketing, they were giving gamers something they had never seen before, 3D, and the entirely new gaming experiences that came along with it. Ocarina of Time, Mario 64, Tomb Raider, none of these were available on the 16-bit consoles, or for that matter on the Jaguar or 3DO. Sony and Nintendo were looking to the future at how to wow gamers, how to incorporate the next amazing technology. Though the Jaguar could do decent 3D, they only had a smattering of 3D titles, often late in the console's lifespan, with their early 3D games not holding up to later releases on the N64 or PlayStation. You never saw a game the likes of Majora's Mask on the Jaguar, for example. The Jaguar was built to compete with and beat the Super Nintendo and Mega Drive, not to move technology to an entirely new level. Right from the start, Jaguar was a step behind and there's no indication that they were considering anything different afterward. This is the mindset that ultimately killed Atari and many other consoles. Without this changing, it would have been impossible for Atari to release a new, revitalized project with different prospects. That's even if it wasn't already too late by 1995. By then, Atari was merely trying to wrap up as many projects as they could in preparation for the impending reverse merger with JTS. So as sad as it was and is to see the demise of the very first huge gaming company, a company who released the first popular arcade games and home consoles, it's hard to imagine any realistic way back for Atari in 1995. And even in 1993, it only could have happened with some radical changes. Sure, a new simplified console design with an affordable price tag, built-in CD technology and a few AAA games may have pulled it back for Atari, but that's not who Atari were in the mid-90s. If they had been able to do that in 1995, they would have done that long before then, and we wouldn't be talking about it now.